Hi everybody, it's great to be here. My name is Eilam, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Argon, and today I want to talk about the software supply chain. So this is me, coming to you today from Tel Aviv. And just a word about Argon. So Argon's mission is to help companies release software securely, uh, meaning we help protect each and every phase of their software supply chain. And we'll dive into that in just a few slides. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, so an intro of me and Argon is done. Uh, and just a few words about the software supply chain, what it is and how it comes into play. We're going to speak about a few of the recent attacks and we'll dive into two of them specifically. Um, after that, we're going to have a live demo of an attack and how it looks like in the wild. Um, and we'll see how Algon comes into play in all of that. And that's it for today. So a little bit about the software supply chain. The software supply chain is actually a term that is borrowed from the physical world, uh, where it is used to describe the path or the route uh, physical products or services um, take from the moment they are composed in the factory uh, from all those different ingredients throughout the entire chain of supply up until the time they are delivered to uh, my doorstep. Um, so the software world uh, concept, the concepts are pretty similar. Uh, so we can see here the five different phases of the software supply chain. Uh, so starting from the code itself and the source code management platforms that manage it. Um, throughout the materials, which is another way of saying dependencies. So open source dependencies and CI pipeline dependencies, we'll see how those look like uh, later on. Um, then we have the build phase, uh, CI pipelines taking raw lines of source code, uh, compiling them, um, and finally achieving uh, a final form of artifact. Uh, those need to be managed as well, so we have all those different um, package registries for artifact management um, and the final phase is the deployment phase where you take the final docker image or npm package and deploy it to the relevant environment uh, let's say your kubernetes cluster in the production so here we have a relatively simple example i guess um, of this type of chain we can see that uh, the technological change that was introduced here in the just recent years um, is very dramatic. So we didn't used to look anything like that. Just a couple of years ago, um, companies would release software uh, completely different. Um, you would have this quarterly release night. Everything would go according to some project plan, uh, a lot of human intervention in the process. Um, today, this is uh, not the case. So software companies can release software tens of times a day uh, with full automation without any human intervention. Um, and the technological change was very quick to, uh, to come into play. Here we can see some of the major recent events just in the last few years um, to understand how quickly this has come. Um, so we can see that in 2015, GitLab uh, was just a 10 employees company. Uh, after that, in 2016, Google Cloud Build was only released in beta. Uh, today is one of the more popular build platform out there. Um, Bitbucket Pipeline replaces Bamboo just in late 2017. Uh, Azure DevOps Cloud was, was introduced in 2018. Um, granted, Microsoft did have uh, TFS platforms, but uh, some would argue that is, it is different. Um, GitHub Action, uh, I guess it, this is the more interesting part. So GitHub Action um, is the third most CI used today. Um, it was only released in general availability in 2019, so just shy of two years ago. Um, and GitHub Container Registry is production, uh, production ready just last year. Uh, so we can see how a lot of the services, a lot of the products of a lot of the companies uh, that we use today and we almost take for granted was just, were just introduced uh, in the last couple of years. So... Um, Argon conducted a survey uh, to ask companies, to ask security leaders how this change has affected them. Uh, we can see the results here, but we don't have to look at all the numbers now. This is just for show. Um, I'll tell you about three main data points that I find to be interesting. So the first one, which is kind of obvious, I guess, uh, over 90% of companies today use full CI-CD automation to deploy software to production. Uh, I guess today this is not a big surprise. However, only 23% of those same companies um, 
feel that they have confidence in those processes, meaning the rest feel they don't really know what goes on there, they don't have the proper control over it. Um, and when we ask those security leaders, those CISOs and application security team, um, we ask them what was the number one challenge in securing the software supply chain today. Um, and the number one result that we got was collaboration between DevOps and security teams, uh, which I find to be extremely interesting because it has nothing to do with technology and automation uh, and everything to do with people and processes. So let's see some of the recent events that took place involving the software supply chain. Uh, so these are just some of the high profile attacks. I won't go into each and every one of them. We'll just do a quick overview. Uh, so Mercedes had um, a major source code leakage through, through their GitLab on-prem uh, server. Uh, roughly 600 code repositories were leaked online, including very sensitive code projects. Um, later on, uh, CodeCov, an automation company, was breached um, and an attacker was able to modify uh, their uh, software, uh, basically affecting all of CodeCov's customers running that same software in their CI environment um, and uh, caused the leakage of uh, sensitive data directly from those environments. Um, the third one here that we see is the one known as dependency confusion, uh, so a white hat hacker uh, demonstrated how easy it is to trick those package registries, those artifact manager, um, into pulling the wrong code packages from the outside world um, instead of private one developed in-house. Um, and the final and fourth one um, probably doesn't need a lot of explanation. Um, SolarWind was a major build-time code manipulation attack. Uh, basically, an attacker gained access to the build environment um, of the Orion app and was able to modify its source code, affecting um, thousands of users of it. And just last week, uh, we had another major um, incident involving this action, the check spelling action. Um, basically, we can see here a screenshot of the security advisory explaining that workflows using it were vulnerable to leakage of their GitHub token. Uh, and we'll see a live demo of how this looks like uh, in the real world. And just yesterday, uh, less than 24 hours ago, Travis CI uh, published this notice um, noting that all public repositories using Travis as their CI uh, were in danger of leaking secrets directly from those repositories. Um, we can see uh, that the issue is valid only for pub public repositories, uh, which, which I guess should be kind of uh, um, reassuring in a way. Um, and this happened less than 24 hours ago. So let's see how one of those attacks looks like uh, when we dive a little deeper. So taking the check spelling incident, for example, um, we can see here the lines of installation. It's pretty amazing to consider the level of trust that we put in them. Um, we can see here how a workflow could add the check spelling action directly onto the GitHub repository using it. Um, and we can see how the uh, App Store for action looks like. Um, it's no longer just your application today that contains dependencies, but rather your workflows, your CI pipeline. Um, so this means when you release software, uh, someone else's code running as part of this same process uh, is taking place, has access to your repository, to its secrets and to the code itself. Uh, now this is not uh, a dependency of your application. This is not uh, listed in your manifest file, in your package.json file. Uh, this is um, other people code running as part of your CI process. So what happened with check spelling? So we can see here that it's a GitHub action used by a lot of repositories to, well, check the spelling of each pull request submitted against them. Now, its workflow was, uh, say, very improperly configured. We can see a screenshot from their official page about the recommendation of how to set it up. Um, and essentially, each repository using it allowed an attacker to gain write access to them uh, just by submitting a carefully crafted pull request. So this is a screenshot from the advisory, from the security advisory that was published. We can see four repositories using the check spelling action, uh, which enabled the trigger on pull request target. Um, an attacker was able to send a pull request and cause the GitHub access token to be leaked. 
Um, with that token, you can do a bunch of stuff, including read, including write uh, to the target repository. So this is kind of what a workflow using spell checking action would look like. You can see here that the event is on pull request target. Um, and you, when you put that together with checkout of the specific pull request, this is when things uh, become a little messy. Uh, and for those of you who haven't used GitHub Actions before, don't worry, we're going to show uh, live how this workflow can allow an attacker to gain access to your repository. So a couple of workarounds that were suggested suggested um, well the first one would be to simply disable the workflow which I guess is not that much of a fix uh, but rather uh, kind of a first aid kit um, the other would be to uh, kind of change the way that you allow specific actions to run uh, you can allow only actions created by github or only actions verified by github for example um, and I'll show you how this looks like in just a few slides um, Plus you can change the GitHub token uh, level of access, its scope. Uh, by default, it is granted something else rather than simply read. Uh, so these are kind of just the quick fixes. Um, so I created a completely new GitHub repository and added just a, an example workflow uh, to see how those configuration are um, configured by default. So we can see here that the workflow permission is granted read and write access to my repository. These permissions are reflected in the GitHub token itself. So an attacker gaining access to this GitHub token actually has read and write permissions by default to my repository containing this workflow. Another security configuration here that I've also checked is the default uh, action permission. Uh, so basically, if you're managing a GitHub organization, you can control the different level of which actions you're allowed to run. Uh, the default, as we can see here, um, is allow all. Uh, this means I can run anybody else's uh, code which is wrapped in a GitHub action and granted access to my repository, to my source code uh, as part of my workflow. Now the solution itself is a little trickier um, because you would have to not only fix the main branch of your repository uh, and update it to the latest version of check spelling, but rather you would have to fix each and every branch containing a copy of this workflow. Um, because the way this works is each branch has its own workflow file um, and if it is still using the affected version uh, then any pull request submitted against this branch could also trigger uh, this check spelling action with the vulnerable version allowing the leakage of the github token. So let's see how this looks like in the real world. Okay great. So I have here this Roketo app, which is just a simple Node.js public repository. Uh, we can see here it's completely standard with an innocent. Uh, this is the Roketo app readme file. Um, plus I've added um, a very standard node starter workflow, which I've copied directly from the uh, example at GitHub. Um, so we can see here that it really doesn't do much, uh, just a standard workflow for CI. Um, plus I've altered the uh, event we are listening to to be the pull request target event together with checking out of the pull request itself. Uh, now this is the combination that could put you in a lot of uh, trouble um, and we're going to see exactly how just in one second. So another GitHub profile which I have, uh, my alter ego, we can see it here, um, which doesn't have any access to the Roketo organization or the Roketo app. Uh, it can find it, but just because this is a public GitHub repository. Um, and in order to make changes, uh, the other user would have to fork this repository and suggest modification using a pull request. So this is what we're going to do now. I'm going to fork the Roketo app repository. I'll give it a few seconds here. And we can see that now uh, I'm working on this fork of it. Um, so while I'm doing that, I can suggest modification to the source code Specifically, I'm going to suggest modification to the package.json file. Um, now, I'm going to use this script tag uh, in order to run my arbitrary code. Uh, now, there are all these uh, different sorts of ways to run arbitrary code. Um, specifically, running npm test would be something a lot of CI platforms would do. Um, so, I'm going to use this one. We can see here the file with the instructions of my arbitrary code and what it is going to do. Uh, it's divided into three phases. 
So the first one would be to obtain the GitHub token. Now this is accessible because my code would run in the context of the GitLab, GitHub runner. Um, and it does have write access, which is enabled by default. Um, so I'm going to extract this GitHub token using git config uh, just to see uh, where it is stored. Um, once I have this token, I can make a request to GitHub to modify uh, the source code of the Roketo app. Uh, I would obviously have to use this token um, and I will also send this token back so we can see it together. So I'm taking all those lines and I've compiled them into one long line uh, just to be placed in the skip tab. So we can copy paste this one here um, and we'll suggest modification. So now these test scripts contain my arbitrary code. I can commit the changes to the main branch. This is only on my fork copy of the repository. Uh, however, now that I have some modification, I can offer them uh, in the form of a pull request. So I'll, I'll open up a pull request targeting the Roketo app. Great, once I'll do that, the Roketo app, uh, which has my workflow, would start validating, checking my pull request. Uh, now, while this is running, we can take a look here at the readme file. We'll give it a few seconds for the workflow to be done. Um, maybe we'll see what it does in the meantime. Uh, so it's running NPM test as part of my uh, workflow. Uh, now this would run my arbitrary code. Uh, we'll see in a second the results of it. So if I go here, this is the Roketo app. Uh, I guess if I refresh the page, this no longer would be the case. So you can see I am in. Uh, now this modification to one of the files, the readme file in my repository, uh, the Roketo app, was made by a user that doesn't have any access to this GitHub repository. Um, so we can see the workflow itself has run this uh, cleverly put uh, arbitrary code uh, with the changes and also sent back uh, the access token for me to see. So we can see here, uh, the access token was sent. Uh, I have this secret eater listening uh, for any secrets being sent from the GitHub workflow. Um, we can see this GitHub token here. Okay, now what are we going to do about this workflow? So um, the obvious thing would be to change the event, right? So um, that now we will no longer listen to the pull request target event. So we can do that and just listen to pull request event. Plus we'll remove this line because it doesn't really, uh, it isn't really needed here now. Great, so now this uh, workflow would only be triggered by pull request event. Um, so we can go back here to the action tab and we'll try the same thing again. So I'll go to my folk um, that is located here. I'm going to fetch the updates and I'll do another change. So this time maybe just um, kind of change one of the lines in this JavaScript file just so that we can open a pull request. Great. So now I have other modifications to suggest. I'm going to open a pull request with them. And we should see the workflow running here. Um, so we can see that it was triggered. Um, and we immediately see different results. Uh, so the workflow was triggered, but it didn't run. It is waiting for approval. Uh, so firstly, this is obviously much better um, results than the previous code injection. Uh, so I let this workflow run, I'll give it the manual approval it needs. Great, and let's see how this looks like. We'll give it a few seconds to set up. So it's still processing my pull request, however it is doing it in a different context on the event of the pull request instead of the pull request target. Um, so we can see that the NPM test has run successfully. Um, so my injected code is still running as part of this workflow. However, now I'm getting this error message saying resource not accessible by integration. Uh, now this is GitHub letting me know that the access token I've used here to 
try and alter the readme file of the Roketo app again doesn't really allow me to do that. Now this access token uh, only have read access. It, does, it isn't able to change uh, the file in the target repository. Um, and what about the other code, the one where I send the token back home? Uh, so we can see that the third one, another one was added here. Uh, so my secret eater did get to eat another secret. Um, and this is the GitHub token generated by this uh, workflow runner. So the case is a little better. Uh, I'm not able to uh, alter the repository. However, I did manage to send back home uh, the access token. Now, the reason I was able to do that is because there is another important thing to notice when using this workflow. And this is this step. So the checkout step. Uh, now the checkout step uh, has another uh, kind of property by default that is enabled, which we need to pay attention to. Uh, it is called persist credentials. Uh, so if I'll suggest modification here using the width command and persist credentials set to false, which is not the default, um, then we should expect to see another flow of events. So let's target this, pool, this workflow, sorry, one more time. We're gonna to go to the uh, fork, the copy of it, and fetch the updates. And again, suggest a modification. Let's say just add an empty line. So now we are able to open a pull request and trigger this workflow from remote. So we can see just now this workflow has been triggered. I'm going to approve and run it. Great. And keep in mind here, we are um, waiting for the secret to be populated. So we can see the workflow started to run. Um, it will run my arbitrary code and it would fail. Um, now, just a second. So we'll take a look at the failure. So the reason for the error message here um, is because the uh, GitHub access token was not available to it. And we can see that here, uh, we didn't get any new lines. So the secret eater uh, that is listening for uh, GitHub tokens did not manage to get it. Um, so I hope this clarifies the change um, of the different events of the workflow um, and the nuance of using persist credential uh, false together with the checkout action. Um, because otherwise the default would be true, uh, meaning that the rest of the workflow would have full access to the Git token uh, and is able to send it out to whichever location uh, that it wants. Great, so going back to the um, recent attacks. Another attack that is also around the issue of workflows um, is code code. We touched on that in the overview um, and we can see the lines that are required to be targeted by this attack here. Uh, so if you're using the code code action, if you were using it, um, you were potentially uh, leaked uh, you have potentially leaked sensitive information directly from your CI environment. Um, we can see that CodeCov is an extremely popular test coverage tool. Um, you use it as part of your CI, either with a dedicated GitHub action or simply by placing the uh, curl command to download it. Um, and it was hacked pretty bad. Uh, so when a attacker was able to modify uh, one of their automation scripts, basically affecting all of CodeCov's customers using it at the time. Um, Okay, so to be a little more specific, we don't really know how uh, CodeCov was hacked. Uh, however, um, it was noted, noted that its Google Cloud uh, access key was leaked through one of the Docker images, uh, which it turns out is an extremely easy thing to do when constructing a Docker image. Uh, engineers can uh, leave sensitive data behind. We can see here an example of a Docker history command, which can also be very revealing by itself. Now, the bash uploader, the utility that was uh, hacked, is a small utility, looks kind of like this, 
um, and it is responsible for uploading the test coverage results back to the code core platform. And then all the attacker did once he was able to modify the file um, was add this one new line. Uh, it's a pretty simple line. Uh, most of you probably understand what it does just by looking at it. Uh, it prints out the environment variables uh, that are accessible since this, since this is something running in my CI environment and sends them out to a remote server. Uh, so we can expect to find data like uh, access token, user credentials, and API keys. Now the results of this hack were pretty massive. So a lot of high, uh, high name profile companies uh, did publicly notify they were affected, um, but not only private companies. So a lot of open source projects using it as part of the CI um, some of them are extremely popular. So we can see Algo CD, uh, Webpack, Ansible, even Kubernetes uh, using it. Uh, in fact, if you go to GitHub and search for the command to download the affected file, you will get a few hundred thousand of results, um, of, reference, of references of it being used today. So let's see how this looks like. So we'll jump back to this workflow. This time we can look at this one here. Uh, so this is another workflow, just a pretty standard one again with the pull request target um, line. However, I've added this extra step directly copied from the uh, official website of the official instructions uh, of how to upload my test coverage result. Uh, so you can see that I'm running the curl command to download this automation script uh, as part of my release process. Um, now this is something a lot of companies uh, today have lurking as part of the CI pipeline. We're talking about uh, tens of pipelines, hundreds of pipelines, um, and it's extremely hard to keep track of anything that runs as part of that. So um, one of the tools that Aragon has built to help mitigate these types uh, of risks is this um, Argon CLI, um, and it accepts CI workflows. Uh, it goes over them, deconstructs the instruction. It doesn't matter if they are written um, as a GitHub workflow, Azure pipeline, a Bitbucket pipeline, or even GitLab CI. Um, anything you use, uh, you can deconstruct uh, and apply custom logic on it. So it helps you avoid these uh, security issues, those misconfigurations, those untrusted user inputs. Um, we can run it here. Um, okay, so we can see um, here, this is how it looks like. This is the util. Um, you can see that it's scanned um, one workflow file uh, this is the one to the left, and it has all those insights on it. So starting from uh, unpinned actions, uh, which allows kind of flexibility into which code you're running, uh, to suspicious use of environment variables, um, and even the pull request target event, which we referenced earlier. So we can see here um, that it lets me know that a pull request elevated access uh, could be granted. Um, we need to take a look at this specific line here uh, in my workflow, uh, when combined with the checkout action, this is definitely something that we suck would put me in risk. Um, another thing we can see here is that credentials stored in disks. So this means uh, I'm not setting the uh, persist credentials flag to false. So uh, GitHub token is kept on disk and is available for any secret eater out there uh, to consume them. Now the relevant line here is code code. So we can see here that um, uh, the Argon pipeline scanner has actually very uh, noticed that there is an unverified external dependency. So someone else's code running in my CI, um, actively running on every release, um, and it lets me know which line it has been detected. Uh, so we can see one file scan with seven findings. Uh, one is critical, the other are medium, um, and it also allows me to take action on it. So not only find the relevant uh, security issues, but also kind of to take action. We can see here, sorry, um, a pull request. So when, when the workflow contains an unverified um, step, Argon helps you uh, kind of add verification layer on that. So it is added as a pinned GitHub action, um, which helps you kind of use um, checksum level verification that anything that is running as part of your CI uh, is in fact, uh, should in fact run there. Um, the same goes for any uh, of those gotchas, those small kind of uh, very dangerous misconfigurations that could be easily avoided. Um, so we can do it kind of uh, in an automatic flow. Um, and let's go back here. 
Great, so now that we saw some of how all of those scenarios looks like uh, in the wild, so um, an important thing to realize about the software supply chain is that we often think of it as just one long unified process. Uh, however, it is composed of five different uh, layer or phases. Um, so the first one would be to secure your source code throughout the dependencies, the pipelines themselves building it, uh, the artifacts that are being managed and up until time of deployment. Um, and in order to fully protect uh, this chain, we need to secure each and every link in it. Uh, and if we fail to do so, then we get incidents like um, code code which was a failure in securing one of the dependencies. Um, or SolarWind, which we already talked about earlier, um, a failure to secure the build environment. Uh, or the dependency confusion, um, which could have been avoided with proper control over the package registries, the artifact servers themselves. And the list goes on, so CNCF on GitHub can uh, easily show you a list of the software supply chain incidents that took place recently. Um, the list does go on. Um, you can find more details um, by checking that out. So a little bit about the solution, uh, what to do about security of the software supply chain. Um, so Argon has created this framework. Uh, it, is, it correlates very well to the five different phases uh, and it offers one through eight, the set of controls uh, that are required to be put in place in order to fully secure the software supply chain. Um, so we can see some of them here um, and if and only if those controls are in place, uh, then we can hope to avoid incidents like the one that we mentioned. Uh, we can see how each one of them targeted a different phase of the supply chain um, and how the solution, uh, how those control gates could help mitigate them. Uh, now, obviously, what we just saw uh, with the Argon and the pipeline scanner is only a small portion of the solution. Uh, in order to fully protect the supply chain, uh, we need a unified security solution. So uh, protecting each phase of the process uh, kind of helps you create a governance layer on top of it and obviously prevent any, um, in any affected versions of your product from being released to production. So I'm going to end with one of the uh, more interesting quotes that I just recent, recently saw from GitHub Security Lab. Um, any modern build or orchestration is complex enough to have multiple code injection points. Uh, so I think this kind of reflects well uh, the fact that the technology has changed. Uh, build orchestration is now so complex uh, that even GitHub themselves uh, let you know that multiple code injection points uh, can definitely be found there. So that's it for today. I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions or any thoughts on that, feel free please feel free to keep in touch. Uh, and this is it for today. Thank you. Bye-bye.